The year is 2324. Humanity has transcended its earthly cradle to become a true solar system civilization. We've built massive networks of habitats beneath the surface of Mars, towering cities on Titan. We float amidst the clouds of Venus and mine the asteroids that drift between worlds. Over two and a half billion of us now call these distant places home. Thanks to revolutionary anti-aging technologies, people no longer count their lives in decades, but in centuries, perhaps even longer. Artificial general intelligences propel our advancements at unprecedented speeds. But how did we get here, and what does life look like across our interplanetary society? As mentioned in part one of the series, this is the concept. I usually do alternate history, and this video is not particularly different. Instead of going back and changing an event, I'm just going forward with a set of parameters that may or may not turn out to be true. They were originally that reusable rockets lower launch costs, the world becomes multipolar, driving competition, and that self-sufficiency in space becomes a major goal of the world's superpowers, because once we have self-sufficiency on the moon, we have a super cheap launching off point for the rest of the solar system. Achieving self-sufficiency on the moon is very expensive initially, but once it is achieved, space travel becomes much more trivial. It suddenly makes economic sense. So picking up a century or so after we left off, in 2324, we have automated mines and human settlements on nearly every sizable celestial body. Our population has stabilized at almost 12.8 billion, around the same as a century prior. Out of the 12.8 billion people, more than 2.5 billion now live across the solar system, mostly in massive underground habitats and space stations. This expansion results from centuries of development driven by powerful sentient artificial general intelligences, or AGIs, programmed to help their nations stay competitive. These AGIs advance technology at an unprecedented pace. Revolutionary small staple fission and later fusion reactors made power generation simple and easy just about anywhere. Fusion-powered rockets capable of long continuous acceleration burns drastically reduce travel times and fuel consumption, making trips across the solar system a matter of days and weeks instead of years. And with lab-grown meat and synthesized plant matter replacing traditional farming, food production became as cheap and simple in space as on Earth. As a result of all this, humans can now live virtually anywhere. Antarctica inside an asteroid or on Mercury, provided the minimum necessary resources are available. Now, let's take a look at the state of human civilization across the solar system. In the 2300s, Earth is still home to the vast majority hosting the powerful United Nations of Earth and Luna, a fairly complicated political entity, basically a confederation made up of even more confederations as well as sovereign states. Administrative and governmental bodies are multi-layered and quite complicated. Where power lies depends on the region and isn't universal. The highest governing body on Earth is the United Nations, which is a confederation that represents Earth's interests in the solar system. It has a full-fledged parliament, government, and military. Below the UN are Earth's administrative zones. These zones have varying degrees of authority, with some only existing for statistical and trade purposes, and others being outright political unions. Finally, we have sovereign states, or countries. These function as you would know them in the 21st century for the most part, although notably they do have way less power due to all these international organizations. With an overview, let's now explore each administrative zone. The North American Union is a confederation with extensive powers, but where individual members still retain the final say. Formed as a balanced union between Canada, the US, and Mexico, its creation was influenced by cultural blending on the US-Mexico border and Canada's rapidly growing population due to climate change making it more habitable. These factors pushed the US to cooperate more closely with its neighbors in an increasingly multipolar world. The South American administrative zone has more limited authority, where power lies with individual countries. Once spearheaded by a growing Brazil that resolved many internal struggles by the end of the 21st century, it is now a more balanced region where countries like Argentina provide a counterweight. The European Administrative Zone is made up of the European Union, a fully-fledged federation at this point, and its close associates. The gradual federalization of the EU was driven by the need to stay relevant in a multipolar world and address continent-wide issues. Turkey has also become quite significant within this zone, benefiting from European support during proxy wars in the Middle East against Chinese-backed Iran. By 2324, the Middle Eastern Administrative Zone is relatively stable but bears scars from centuries of conflict. As oil lost profitability with the rise of renewables and fusion energy, revolts in the UAE, Qatar, and Bahrain led migrant workers to topple their governments, forming the Gulf Union. The Saudi intervention, however, devastated the mainland territories, leaving only a smaller island nation around Qatar and Bahrain. 
Although today, the renamed Kingdom of Arabia is more tolerant and secular, having become a constitutional monarchy with semi-democratic institutions. A South Africa-style solution was implemented in Israel and Palestine in the 21st century, granting equal citizenship rights to all, which ended overt conflict despite lingering animosities. The Middle Eastern Administrative Zone holds little administrative power, existing mostly for statistical and trade purposes. To the west lies the Maghreb Administrative Zone, synonymous with the Maghreb Union. Its relative isolation due to the Sahara Desert, as well as its close ties to Europe and the Middle East, have made it fairly wealthy. The Union formed gradually through growing economic ties and cooperation in the face of severe water scarcity caused by climate change affecting the entire region. The Eurasian Administrative Zone formed from the Russian-influenced part of China's sphere of influence. Similarly, the Central Asian Administrative Zone represents China's sphere of influence in the Middle East, which outside of Pakistan, which really is its own thing, is mostly Iranian-influenced. China, meanwhile, constitutes its own administrative zone. Throughout the 21st century, it grew to become a global superpower, rivaling the US and Europe in this multipolar world. Population decline before the advent of anti-aging medication, coupled with automation, actually ended up improving living standards in the long run, as wealth was shared among fewer people. The East Asian administrative zone includes Japan, Korea, as well as Taiwan, essentially the American sphere of influence in Asia. Facing rapid population decline, East Asia spearheaded the development of anti-aging medication, which became essential for their survival. Further south is ASEAN, a true political union where members retain some sovereignty, mirroring the 21st century EU. As Indonesia grew into a major world power, ASEAN became an extension of its sphere of influence. However, coalitions of other members often prevented Indonesia from becoming overwhelmingly dominant within the union. Isolated in a remote part of the globe, Oceania is an administrative zone comprised of Australia, New Zealand, and their Pacific Island sphere of influence. Both countries experienced immense population growth from climate refugees across Asia. South Asia is by far the most populous administrative zone, primarily due to India's immense growth in the 21st century. The zone is an extension of India's sphere of influence in Asia. The Western African Administrative Zone formed around Nigeria's sphere of influence as it rose to become a regional power in the late 21st and early 22nd centuries. The Eastern African Administrative Zone formed around two rival regional powers, Ethiopia and the East African Federation. Emerging from Congo's sphere of influence, the Middle African Administrative Zone was once rife with conflict. The unification of the former two Congos stabilized the area. The Southern African Administrative Zone, meanwhile, is a relatively balanced union between the various Southern African powers, most notable ones being South Africa and Mozambique. Perhaps the most unique administrative zone on Earth itself is the United Territories of Antarctica, a proper federation made up of Antarctic settlements established by various world powers throughout the past several centuries. Antarctica went from hosting just science outposts to outright permanent settlements as climate change gradually made it warmer and more hospitable, and probably more importantly, technology used for space colonization also made living in Antarctica more feasible. Finally, the Earth's only moon, Luna, also acts as an administrative zone colonized in the 21st century, to streamline access to the solar system, major powers founded numerous settlements, which over time developed unique cultures and a desire for political representation. In the early 22nd century, these colonies consolidated under the Lunar Council, transforming Luna into a UN administrative zone. The council serves as a civil administration, representing lunar inhabitants, while Earth governments retain their spaceports. These spaceports and their infrastructure still dominate life on Luna. These regions and their nations do compete and see conflict, but not quite like in the 21st century. In the 2300s, war as we know it has changed. Mutually assured destruction has become so engraved a concept that everyone just knows war rarely if ever makes sense. Many people being centuries old and knowing they can live almost indefinitely also changes their moral and philosophical beliefs. Dying at 83 is at this point considered a tragedy. You barely even got to live, so people are no longer really willing to die for most causes. But when direct warfare does occur, it's automated warfare with AI-controlled drones and defense systems which have taken over all combat. This means the result of any actual war would also be a pretty simple math equation, being determined by resource control and production capacity. But it also means a small nation armed to the teeth with thousands of self-replicating automated war machines, each capable of launching nuclear attacks, can do some real damage to a larger nation, even if they would lose. So instead of traditional wars, Economic sanctions and blockades are the primary tools of conflict, making physical warfare a rarity. Diplomatic systems mediate most disputes through negotiations and legal frameworks. 
This is how and why large organizations like the UN have so much power. We need them. But competition between major powers persists, just through resource control, production, economic dominance, and more importantly than anything, technological development through artificial general intelligences. As covered in my previous video, competition is not just limited to Earth. With more than a century of continued growth, human civilization is truly interplanetary. Moving out from the Sun, the Mercury territory has little to no say in solar system politics, as it has no central administrative body of its own. Colonized late due to the high travel cost and water scarcity, it has become a focal point of major powers across the solar system as constant acceleration fusion-powered engines have made the trip less of a hassle. As an international territory, its habitats act as sovereign entities amid shared space. Offering surface gravity akin to Mars, Mercury attracts settlements and outposts from all major powers. With Mars investing heavily, inhabitants on Mercury have to reside underground to shield themselves from the intense solar radiation and solar storms. The Venus territory, much like Mercury, has little to no say in solar system politics as it has no central administrative body of its own. The solar system's major powers each maintain settlements here. Despite its scorching surface, higher up Venus uniquely offers natural radiation protection and somewhat habitable conditions. Inhabitants reside in floating megastructures high in the atmosphere where pressure and temperature are just right. It was colonized late due to the immense cost and difficulty of maintaining these floating cities, hence the low population. Recent advances have, however, enabled automated surface mining, improving sustainability. The United Nations of Earth and Luna is of course one of the solar system's great powers. As mentioned before, the United Nations of Earth and Luna is how Earth nations are represented in a broader solar system community. As new powers emerged across the solar system, Earth and Luna's nations ceded more authority to the UN in order to defend Earth's interests. The Martian Federation is yet another great power in the solar system. It was the first planet to be colonized, gaining its independence in the 2200s and unifying as a single state. Martians predominantly live underground to shield themselves from radiation, common practice across the solar system. Ceres is for the most part irrelevant in solar system politics, often just acting as a chess piece for great power competition. The largest object in the asteroid belt became a strategic focal point during the competition between Earth's various nations and arising Mars for colonies and resources. Ceres served as a crucial outpost amid this rivalry. Ceres is a near-zero-G environment rendered conventional habitats impractical. To overcome this, inhabitants reside in underground rotating cylinders, a common solution in near or full microgravity environments like asteroids or space stations. Life on Ceres is pretty representative of the asteroid belt at large, with Ceres just being the biggest settlement. The Jovian Commonwealth is yet another great power in the solar system. Jovian civilization is centered on Callisto, Jupiter's outermost large moon, as the intense radiation belt surrounding Jupiter's inner moons made them near uninhabitable. Benefiting from genetic treatments against cosmic rays and its distance from the sun, Callisto hosts ground cities with thick walls and magnetic fields, and Ganymede hosts a few heavily shielded subterranean colonies, a testament to Jovian determination and political will. Minor resource settlements exist on Himalaya and other small irregular moons as well. The union of Titan and the Saturn system is the final great power in the solar system. Civilization here is centered around Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Titan uniquely benefits from atmospheric pressure suitable for human habitation, offering natural radiation protection. This allows for vast above-ground cities similar to those on Earth, with Luna-like gravity, methane seas and rain, as well as peak daylight resembling Earth's twilight. Titan is a very familiar yet alien place. Titan is the center of civilization around Saturn, but moons like Rhea, Iapetus, and Hyperion also host notable settlements. The United Moons of Oranos is a middling power, often staying out of solar system politics. As a balanced union among Oranos' moons, it emerged in the 22nd century as a neutral and self-reliant entity in the outer solar system. Titania and Oberon are its most prominent members, with Umbriel and Ariel also playing significant roles. Due to the near microgravity environments, inhabitants live in underground rotating cylinders. Isolated by vast distances, traveling to the nearest system can take over a month. The Union trades with the inner planets, but is mostly neutral politically and left to its own devices. The Neptune sovereignty, like Oranos, is a middling power often staying out of solar system politics. Centered entirely around Neptune's largest moon, Triton, it emerged as a self-reliant and neutral entity in the distant reaches of the solar system. Due to Triton's low gravity, about half that of Luna, inhabitants primarily live in underground rotating cylinders, 
although a few surface outposts do exist. Pluto, together with its companion Sharon, stands as a cornerstone of human civilization in the Kuiper Belt. Like most of the Kuiper Belt, it is fairly irrelevant in solar system politics, being its own little world almost. Similar settlements exist further out on Haumea, Makemake, -Make, Eris, and all across the Kuiper Belt. Further away, and I mean way further away, we get to a more distinct human settlement, namely the Persephone outposts. Persephone, theorized in 2014 as an explanation to the odd orbits of many Kuiper Belt objects like Sedna, being referred to as Planet 9, and then later truly discovered in the late 2030s, stands as humanity's gateway to the cosmos. Even with constant acceleration drives, the trip takes close to a year from the core solar system, so Persephone is an international territory, hosting only research outposts that push the boundaries of deep space habitation. With almost no light, the sun only appearing as a very bright star, gravity similar to that of Luna on its largest moon Melanoi, the Persephone system offers a harsh yet invaluable testing ground as humanity prepares to journey to other star systems. Melanoi is capable of hosting normal surface spaces due to its lunar-like gravity, while Makaria and Hecate, with their low gravity, each host a single rotating base. For decades, eager explorers and experts have been studying the effects of deep space living here in the Persephone system, in preparation for one of the most monumental efforts in human history, namely interstellar colonization. That's about all for now, as interstellar colonization and terraforming will be the topic of my next video in this series. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and a big thank you to all my channel members. See you next time.